This conference will now be recorded. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jorge, and I'm the program manager at Dr. for Change. Today joining me is Dr. Alicia Kowachuk of Baylor College of Medicine. And our main objective today is to help answer any questions about the upcoming MAT waiver training, and to also give an overview about the opioid epidemic and what's going on here in Harris County and what we're doing to help address the issue. So I'm gonna pass the mic over to Dr. Kowachuk to give us a bit of a background on, um, on your expertise on this subject. I know you wear multiple hats and you do a lot in our community. So I'm uh, excited to hear about this opportunity. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Jorge. So uh, my name is Alicia, Dr. Kowachuk, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at Baylor uh, College of Medicine. Uh, and I've been working in the addiction medicine field uh, since 2004. Um, here in Houston and since 2001 uh, in my overall career. Uh, and currently I have a number of grant funded initiatives addressing the opiate epidemic in our greater Houston community. Uh, and I work at several uh, treatment programs uh, and through the Harris Health System, uh, providing addiction medicine services to our underserved community here in town. Uh, and we are having a MAT waiver training uh, coming up this Saturday from 8 a.m. to noon. Uh, please join us for that if you can. Absolutely, thank you. And just to jump in real quick, um, in order to get them, uh, in order to get the registration link, please visit our website at www.doctorsforchange.org, and you'll see a hyperlink somewhere on top of the menu where you'll be able to register. Excellent, thank you for that. So we're going to go on now to a little bit about the opiate epidemic and perhaps why um, it's so important for um, more providers in the community to uh, treat opiate use disorder in their practice. And so we're going to talk about the uh, etiology and epidemiology of the opiate epidemic uh, and then uh, talk about ways to effectively address this in our community. So how do we get here? So um, we started out looking at pain as the fifth vital sign uh, back in the uh, late 90s, uh, early 2000s. And this uh, move was driven uh, by recognition that as particularly uh, in addressing acute pain, uh, we were under treating that in the medical community. And this is just one study from 2005 that looked at patients eight years and older with this pain score of at least four out of 10 the median score was eight. And uh, most patients had their pain assessed, and this, again, was in emergency center patients. Um, but just over half received any treatment for their pain, and it took about an hour and a half to get treatment started um, for patients that, that did get treatment. And over almost three quarters were discharged in moderate to severe pain. And so the American Pain Society and uh, the Joint Commission uh, came out with some recommendations, not mandates, but recommendations uh, around addressing uh, pain as the fifth vital sign. And after that, we really saw an increase in opioids being used uh, for pain uh, in our healthcare system. And so we see that there was a 400-fold increase uh, in the decade 97 to 2007 in the milligram per person use of prescription opiates. Uh, and since 2011, overdose is now the leading cause of accidental death uh, in um, 18 to 44-year-olds in the U.S. And we've now um, seen more overdose deaths per year than the total U.S. casualties in the Vietnam War. And that's been since about 2016, so every year. So um, this is another way of looking at the data, looking a bit further out. So this is the 2000s uh, decade. And we see, again, um, that middle line is opioid-related deaths per 100,000 U.S. population. And it saw a steady um, linear rise, uh, essentially. Um, and it, it tracks right along with the increase in opioid sales. Uh, and that is pharmaceutical sales, uh, not street sales. Uh, in kilograms per 10,000 U.S. population. We also see a concurrent rise uh, in opioid treatment admissions uh, for opiate use disorder um, as well. 
And so this is looking a little bit further out. So what's happened since the 2000s? What happened in the 2000 teens? And what we really saw was um, while prescribing rates for 100 people declined after a lot of attention has been paid in the medical community uh, to adjust prescribing patterns, um, to reclassify hydrocodone products, for example, from Schedule 3 to Schedule 2. Uh, and so we've seen a corresponding decrease in prescribing rates, although still above what we saw in the year 2000, for example. Um, but we've seen um, not a decrease in opioid-related uh, deaths, uh, but a, a dramatic and now exponential rise, uh, largely driven by synthetic opioids uh, like fentanyl um, after, um, after heroin as well. Um, so again, as um, people were not getting uh, access to prescription opioids, it wasn't like if they've developed an opiate use disorder, it just disappeared. Um, and they really transitioned uh, to what was more accessible and affordable in their communities, which has often been uh, of late heroin and fentanyl. And those, um, those curves uh, continue uh, pretty much unabated uh, in the remaining half of the 2000 teens into today. Next slide. Uh, so a little bit about the synthetics. Uh, so heroin is two times as potent as morphine. So MEQ is morphine equivalents. Uh, fentanyl is 100 times as potent as morphine. And a lethal dose is as little as two milligrams, which is two grains of, of uh, equivalent to two grains of salt, which is the upper right-hand uh, photo. Uh, carfentanil, which occasionally passes through communities, usually doesn't last very long in the uh, illicit drug market because it kills customers, which is not a good business model, is 100,000 100, times as potent as morphine. And a lethal dose is 20 micrograms, or the equivalent of a snowflake, which is also uh, pictured in a photo here. And this is really the business model of why synthetics have really taken over many drug, uh, illicit drug markets across the country, including here in Houston. Um, so for about a $2,500 total investment, most of which can be ordered off the internet, such as a pill press, dye mold, um, uh, base fentanyl, uh, and other mixer chemicals, uh, you can get a one milligram fentanyl per pill uh, product, which uh, should not kill your, your customer, which is a good thing, um, and uh, crank out about 25,000 pills uh, from that uh, $2,500 investment at $10 a pill street value. So you clear about a quarter million dollars for a $2,500 investment. So again, that's why we're really seeing it flood uh, drug markets. Next slide, please. These are counterfeit drugs that have been seized um, uh, by HPD. Um, all of these counterfeit drugs uh, contain fentanyl. And so over on the left-hand side, you see uh, what looks like branded Xanax uh, or Alzprazolam, um, two milligram dose, uh, had fentanyl in it. Uh, in the middle, you see uh, a cake of heroin, a brick of heroin uh, actually was cut with fentanyl. To the bottom, you see some branded morphine product, uh, which is actually counterfeit uh, morphine and contained fentanyl. And then over on the right-hand side, you see a hydrocodone product, which actually contained fentanyl in it. Next slide. Uh, and this is, uh, again, courtesy of uh, my colleagues at HPD, um, uh, photos of uh, an illicit pill uh, uh, facility. Uh, this was run out of a storage facility off the Southwest Freeway. Uh, and so you can see those are, that's a close up of the um, pill presses that can crank out about 5,000 pills an hour. Next slide. And uh, these are photos of seized um, uh, dye molds. So you can, again, make uh, your product to look like anything you want, anything that might be um, popular in your particular drug market. And so um, you can see there's even, um, even dye molds to appeal to maybe a younger adolescent crowd. Next slide. So where are we now with the opioid epidemic? We've talked a little, little bit about where we've come from and, and how we may have gotten here, um, but where do we stand now? 
Um, so overdose is the leading cause of death for people under 50 in the U.S. And uh, 2019, which is the last full year data we have, I'll talk about some of the pandemic data in a little bit, we were at 71,000 uh, overdose deaths, and that exceeds the total U.S. casualties during the Vietnam War. Uh, AIDS-related deaths in 1995, which was the worst year of the AIDS crisis, um, and the peak year of U.S. homicides uh, back in 1991. Suicides continue to rise, unfortunately, in our society um, for the past 30 years. Um, and for the first time in modern U.S. history, life expectancy is decreasing for younger generations. We now have on top of it, due to the opioid pan um, due to the uh, COVID pandemic, um, but through 2019, that was largely driven by overdose deaths. And overdose is now the leading cause of perinatal mortality for women. Um, and uh, twice an hour, uh, a newborn is diagnosed with neonatal abstinence syndrome related to opioid exposure in utero. Next slide. And um, so this is just a deeper dive into the National Survey on Drug Use and Health data from Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Association. So you can see that 3.7% of the total U.S. Uh, population, and again, um, this is age 12 and up, uh, have uh, misused opioids in 2019. And you can see the breakdown, uh, 9.7 million, it was prescription pain relievers or 96.6% of opiate misusers, uh, mostly hydrocodone products, some oxycodone and some uh, uh, fentanyl. Uh, heroin users uh, account for uh, about uh, three quarters of a million. Um, and there was a modest decline overall for each opioid category, except prescribed fentanyl, which did not change. Um, next slide. And there's some overlap as well. So again, this is looking at data from 2016 to 2019. And all of this is looking like we're on the right track. We're not decreasing exponentially. Uh, like we increased exponentially, but things are kind of slowly uh, stable or coming down a bit. Um, and that's looking at pain reliever misuse, use disorder, and misuse, uh, starting to misuse. All of those are dropping along with heroin use, heroin use disorder, and um, people starting to use heroin. All looks like good news. Next slide. Um, again, looking at opiate use disorder. Um, by age group, we see that um, that's dropping across all age groups from the adolescent, young adult, uh, kind of, uh, um, and then the overall population, 12 and older. Next slide. And then uh, treatment gains. So the number of people engaging in treatment uh, is increasing, uh, which is really great to see. And you can see that methadone has increased pretty most rapidly. Um, but we're making progress with buprenorphine as well, steady progress. Uh, naltrexone less so, um, uh, but a little bit of a rise there. And overall, we see an increase in the number of uh, people uh, receiving treatment for their opiate use disorder. So all positive trends. So some take home points from 2019, um, we've seen some, some improvement. Um, but despite this improvement, remember the opioid overdose deaths data, which I showed, uh, which again um, increased uh, uh, for 2019. Um, so again, and that increased by uh, almost 5% over 2016 data. And that's again, uh, I mean, 2018 overdose data, uh, which again underscores the risk of uh, illicit um, uh, synthetic opioids in our communities and, and still work to be done because we're still seeing deaths. Next slide. So what happens when an epidemic and a pandemic meet? Um, so we could predict um, we may see increased substance use and overdoses because it's been a really stressful year. There's a lot of isolation room from recovery communities. Uh, so people are increasingly uh, relapsing. Um, changes in what substances are available. So that's definitely had an impact of, um, you know, it's a lot easier to transport small amounts of fentanyl across the border, for example, uh, and then cut it and make street product than it is larger amounts of uh, heroin uh, that are required to get the same potency of an opiate effect in your street product. 
Um, and we've seen a drop in access to care, um, loss of insurance uh, when people lose um, their employment, and also um, many, uh, particularly residential treatment settings, have um, uh, restricted, uh, have had pandemic-related restrictions around their admissions um, to, um, you know, adhere to uh, group size, et cetera. Uh, and uh, keep their uh, residential communities somewhat safe from uh, COVID-19 outbreaks. We do have some preliminary data. Um, this was looking at um, uh, the Western US uh, and that included some Harris County data. Uh, this came out back in uh, September, October, and we saw in the first couple quarters of 2020 uh, uh, about a two thirds uh, increase in fentanyl mortality and fentanyl was found in heroin, stimulants, and prescription pills, so not just things marketed as opiates. Um, and uh, out of this report came some recommendations to increase the standard dose of naloxone in, um, in layperson uh, formulations, um, expanding Medicaid to increase access to care, um, and then public health education campaigns. And then looking at some local HFD data, we've seen overdose calls increased uh, about 30% year over year in the first two quarters of 2020, largely driven by the March through June data. Next slide. So some recent big headlines. Um, so we still are waiting on the calendar year 2020 data, but we have uh, uh, 2020 data through August of 2020 um, and looking at the calendar year September 2019 through August 2020 um, and we've seen that all substance overdose deaths reached a new peak so remember it was 71,000 in 2019 87,000 um, in the year um, uh, the 12 month year, September 2019 to August 2020. And we're actually expecting that the calendar year 2020 data is likely going to top 90,000 for the first time ever. Uh, again, most of this increase in the September through August data was from increases in 2020 data year over year, uh, comparing the monthly data. Um, and you can see in Texas, um, our percent change uh, was about a 34.1% increase in overdoses uh, during that time period. Um, so we are not immune, and we're tracking actually now ahead uh, of the overall US average at 28.8%. Next slide. So how do we help our, our um, community and our community members recover and sustain health. So we definitely want to make sure we are better addressing um, people's pain, particularly chronic pain. And we now know there's little role for opiates in treating chronic non-cancer pain, and that most acute pain requires a maximum of three to seven days of opioid management. And we also know that linking those already um, with a diagnosis of opiate use disorder into treatment with medication-assisted treatment also can help with their chronic pain. We want to prevent overdose fatalities and link people with opiate use disorder to care. So if a patient does, a person doesn't survive their overdose, there's no opportunity to, for intervention and for getting them into recovery. So we want to make sure um, that we're doing overdose education and naloxone distribution throughout our community and particularly as healthcare providers. And we want to help be part of the solution and offer this treatment in our own practices. So how common is chronic pain? Um, so the not so good news, um, the majority of us will have, will experience chronic pain at some time in our lifetime. So 60 to 80%. We see patients who are on methadone maintenance treatment programs um, uh, have an incidence of 62 to 80 percent as well, tracking right along with the um, uh, general population. Um, almost 80 percent of patients getting inpatient substance use disorder treatment services report chronic pain, and more than 60 percent of patients with major depressive disorder will report chronic pain, and about a fifth to a quarter of primary care patients report chronic pain. Our society uh, loses $61 billion annually through lost productivity due to chronic pain. And the most common types, actually, this is listed in order of frequency, is actually headache, 
Uh, we sometimes don't think about headache as chronic pain, um, but for headache sufferers, sufferers um, it can definitely become a chronic condition. Then low back pain, um, arthritis, and other joint pains. So how have we um, seen prescribing guidelines evolve? So we started back in the 90s, uh, industry funded. Now we're non-industry funded with um, our most uh, prevalent prescribing guidelines. We started talking about maybe there's some risky patients out there. We started hearing that um, discussed maybe late 2000s, early 2000 teens. Now we talk about risky drugs. Uh, used to talk about really no upper limit in terms of safety as long as it was helping the patient um, with their pain to really um, now 50 milligrams morphine equivalent is kind of a, a ceiling uh, we should really strive to be below if we're going to use it at all. Uh, from opioids being helpful for chronic non-cancer pain to maybe they play a role to really, you know, there, there's not a huge place for opioid uh, therapy in addressing chronic pain anymore. We should probably seek to avoid them. Next slide. So these are the CDC guidelines in 2000, which came out in 2016. Again, they stress non-pharmacological therapies, so not even NSAIDs and your acetaminophens, but really non-pharmacological therapies first, and then non-opioid pharmacologies uh, for chronic. Again, this is chronic non-cancer pain. Uh, really stress that risk assessment tools, which are out there, things like the ORD, the opiate risk tool. Um, maybe not so helpful. We really need to think about these as risky drugs, not just risky patients. Um, those upper uh, limits of 50 morphine equivalents uh, really is a high dose and really avoiding going beyond 90. And opioids for acute pain, three days, typically sufficient. It's a 52-page guideline. Uh, the crib notes version is on page 16. Uh, the VA Department of Defense came out with their own guidelines in 2017. Again, very similar to CDC. Avoid long-term opiate therapy to treat chronic pain, especially if they have co-occurring substance use disorders, benzo use, age uh, less than 30. Uh, the DA, uh, VA guidelines really suggest there's no safe dose for these medications and stress uh, assessing suicide risk routinely. Um, when you start these medications, if you're going to, uh, and ongoing and offering overdose education and naloxone distribution to anyone on chronic opioids and really stress getting people on medication therapies if they have co-occurring obese disorder and chronic pain to address both. Again, very long report, 198 pages. There's a 30-page summary, <laughs> but there's actually a really nice seven-page pocket card that takes you through all these algorithms for how to assess uh, evaluate and, and offer treatment to patients presenting with chronic pain at various stages uh, in your practice. And there's a link for that there. So what are we trying to do now with um, treating uh, chronic pain? We really want to interrupt the chronic pain brain. So we know that there's a lot of neuroplasticity and that activation of pain centers increases fivefold as people transition from acute to chronic pain. So we're really understanding now that pain causes chronic pain causes changes to the brain. Um, and so we want to use the brain to change uh, the body's response to pain and experience of the pain. So if we think about a typical sequence, someone has an acute pain episode, it sets up a fear response because no one wants to fear be in pain. Um, and so they start avoiding activities, avoiding maybe triggers for that pain or, or things that can increase that pain which decreases their activity level, that decreases their socialization, they have uh, increasing isolation, which we know makes um, the perception of pain uh, and how people uh, experience suffering related to their pain worse, which increases the pain, increases their fear, and we have this vicious cycle. Um, if instead we can interrupt the pain using mindfulness, yoga, other non-pharmacological therapies, maintain or increase function, maintain our increased socialization, we'll see a decrease or a stabilization of their chronic pain over time. And so that's the goal of the new therapy. Next slide. So these are all non-pharmacological treatments that have shown, been shown in uh, randomized controlled trials to be as good or better than opioids for treating chronic non-cancer pain. So we have CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapies, 
fear reduction, mindfulness meditation, yoga, and structured exercise programs. Next slide. For opioid prescribing in Texas, we are now limited to 10 days for new scripts, and we must check the PDMP or prescription drug monitoring program each time we prescribe. Naloxone is also available by statewide standing order at any pharmacy in Texas that stocks it. Unfortunately, not all do. So again, what does an effective community response look like overall? So judicious prescribing of opioids, checking that PDMP, um, making sure that you're um, up to date on the latest guidelines. Um, and you know, a lot of systems now are monitoring practice and setting benchmarks uh, related to safer opioid prescribing for their practitioners. We want to direct um, opioid overdose prevention. Um, so clinicians, pharmacists, first responders, public education, we want to come at this from all directions because again, if someone survives their overdose, there's a real opportunity for intervention and change uh, that can happen. And we definitely want to make sure if we're writing for opiates, uh, we are also uh, co-prescribing uh, naloxone and educating patients on how to use it. Um, and then intervention and linkage to treatment for people with opiate use disorder. And that's really where our Matt Waiver training program comes in. It is free um, and it will help you um, really feel com comfortable and confident in integrating this very life-saving treatment into your practice. So I encourage everyone to join us um, this Saturday. Uh, if you're at all interested, thinking about it, curious about um, engaging uh, in this practice uh, and starting delivering this care, um, we still in this community have a real shortage of treatment availability. Um, and we know we've seen the data from 2019 and, and the last, you know, uh, three to four years of the 2000 teens uh, in our national data that increasing treatment, uh, we see decreasing problems in use. Um, overdoses tend to lag and be a lagging indicator. So that those hadn't fallen pre-pandemic, but now with the opioid epidemic and pandemic uh, of COVID-19 colliding, uh, the need is that much greater. Um, so again, I encourage everyone to join us on Saturday. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Kowalczyk, for giving us that deep, uh, that deep dive into the data in Houston on the opioid epidemic and also what's going on, what, this, what solutions are going on, both pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical. Uh, now I want to take the time to talk a little bit about some common questions that come up about the uh, Matt Waiver training. Um, and I do want to open up, uh, I guess I do want to pass the mic on back to you uh, to help answer any common questions. So um, what are some of the things that you kind of hear most common about the uh, training? So um, one of the things I hear is, you know, uh, does it cost anything? Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what all is involved with the training? So it is an eight-hour training. We do the four, first four hours synchronously um, via Zoom. Um, and then uh, you, uh, once you complete that uh, by attending the Saturday from eight to noon, then you get a link uh, to complete the four hour online portion. Um, I also get a lot of questions about, well, once I take the training, does it expire? No, it doesn't expire. Um, and applying for the waiver, we teach you how to do that right in the training. And it's really simple. It takes about five to 10 minutes to apply for your waiver online. Um, it takes up to uh, um, a month, month and a half to get your waiver once you apply for it. Um, so I encourage everybody to get the training as soon as possible. Um, the other more recent question I've encountered is uh, people um, wondering about uh, the value of the training. So uh, in April, um, so just a, about a week ago, April 28th, um, there was a rule change. Um, um, uh, put out uh, by the federal government that said you don't have to do waiver training in order to apply for a waiver, and that is true. Um, but many people, uh, many providers um, uh, don't feel confident uh, with what they know about um, buprenorphine treatment in particular for opiate use disorder, how to screen for it, how to set up for it in your office, et cetera. And so the training is free and it provides you all that information anyway. So I'm still encouraging people to do the training. You still have to apply for a waiver. It's just you're exempt from having to do the training 
but that is only for um, being able to treat 30 patients, which is your limit for the first year anyway. But if you haven't done the training, you can never go beyond those 30 patients uh, in your practice. And so again, um, since it's free, uh, it does cost your time. So um, uh, I do respect that. Um, but you know, again, um, if you have the time to join us, we're more than happy to have you and we'll answer a lot of your questions uh, and um, help you feel comfortable and confident moving forward to do this work. Um, I've been wavered since 2004. Uh, I've been doing this uh, in practice uh, since then. So I have over a decade of experience with this. Um, and so um, I'm not just talking from a textbook, um, you know, I'm happy to uh, answer questions about real issues that come up with how to integrate this into a practice and really make it work. Uh, so it's doable for you. Absolutely, and that's why this opportunity is so so great. So we definitely encourage folks to join in, be a part of the conversation, and also uh, join us on Saturday. Now, uh, again, just as a quick reminder, uh, in order for you to register, you have to visit our website at www.doctorsforchange.org, and you'll see a link on the top of the webpage that says uh, free MET waiver training. Um, and uh, were there anything else that you felt that uh, you wanted to kind of say as a kind of like an end message in regards to the upcoming training. I did have one question though about it though. Um, yeah, go ahead. So, man, this is like our fifth session and I still can't figure out how to pronounce buformorthine. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. But my question is, is this a uh, MET waiver in order for you to uh, prescribe one medication or is it to prescribe uh, like more than one? So you need a waiver from the DEA to be able to legally prescribe buprenorphine for the treatment of opiate use disorder in your practice. Um, but you'll also learn about the other treatments for opiate use disorder. Um, and in particular, uh, naltrexone can be prescribed in practice as well uh, without a waiver. Um, and so you'll learn about that medication and, and can see if that's a good fit for uh, your practice, either additionally or instead of uh, buprenorphine. Okay, thank you so much for answering that. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Dr. Kowalczyk, for your time. We definitely appreciate it. We different, we appreciate all the work that you do, and we hope everyone who is watching this video is able to join the effort as well. So thank you again, Dr. Kowalczyk, for your time, and I hope you have a wonderful day. You too. See you Saturday. Bye. Right.